Okay, we're going to start with the Sabbath in Genesis, the seventh day. Now remember that creation was completed on which day? That there is no creation week. So if you hear of creation week, you say, oh, that's not right. Creation was completed on the sixth day. And God did not keep the Sabbath on the seventh day. The Hebrew word there means ceased. He ceased what? He ceased creating the other things, okay? And the seventh day in Genesis is a very unique day for a number of reasons. First, there is no formula. And there was evening and there was morning, a seventh day. And I believe that the conditions present on that first seventh day would have continued forever. Now, I'm not saying there wouldn't be an eighth day, ninth day, and so on, if man had not sinned. And that was the one day uh, when, in Scripture, when man and God were in right relationship with each other. And that day serves as a type of rest that we will see all the way through Scripture when man and God are in right relationship with each other. Now, there is no record, biblical or historical, that anyone knew about or kept the Sabbath before the time of Moses. It's confirmed by Scripture. It's confirmed by Jewish scholars. And it's confirmed by scholars of antiquity. And just to kind of a little parenthesis here, if you read some of Ken Wright's books, if you read his book, uh, you know, the, the Sabbath Day, neither pagan nor, uh, what was it, uh, Catholic, he wrote to the leaders of antiquity and so on and asked if there was any record of anybody keeping any day sacred before the time of Moses, and there isn't any. And this is known way back at the time of Ken Wright, and yet the church that we know about dismissed that. There is good evidence, and I don't have time to go into all of it this morning because we have to hurry. There is good evidence to support the belief that the Sabbath was, quote, blessed and sanctified as a required day of rest for Israel at the time of Moses and not in the Genesis account. The Genesis account merely states why it was set aside. Because God rested, okay? And he sanctified it because he rested, but he didn't sanctify it until the actual time of Moses. The ten, now, this is, this is critical. And if you are a new transitioning Adventist, you must get this down. The words of the covenant are the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to give more than one text. You know, it says we should have two or three texts to support Scripture. There's plenty of them. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water, and he wrote on the tablets the what? The words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Is there any question there that the words of the covenant are the Ten Commandments? No. Okay. Exodus 31:18. When he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. Deuteronomy 4.13, so he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the what? The Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tables of stone. Deuteronomy 9, I went up to the mountain to receive the tables of stone, the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you. And again, 9.11, and it came about at, that, at the end of 40 days and nights that the Lord gave me two tables of stone, the tables of the covenant. Now that is clear, it is repeated time and time again. And it's emphasized again in the New Testament, which we'll get to later. So, the words of the covenant are, or the Ten Commandments are, you got it. Okay. Now, the other laws in the one law, okay, now there's only one law. There's not two laws or three laws. There's one law that God gave to Israel. The Ten Commandments are part of that one law. The other laws outside of the Ten Commandments interpreted the Ten Commandments for the nation of Israel. For example, where do you find do not steal? Okay, but the Ten Commandments don't tell you what to do if somebody steals an ox. Okay, or if a thief is caught breaking in, what do you do with a thief who's trying to steal something? 
Or what about an animal that's grazing in a neighbor's field? You know, the neighbor has better clover than yours, so the animal goes over and eats your neighbor's clover. He's basically stealing his clover. Did they have clover in those days? I don't know. Anyway, what I'm, the point I'm making is the other laws of Torah often explain and interpret and expand the basic truth of the Ten Commandments. So we're going to do the same with the Sabbath. Now, do not cook is not found in Exodus 20, is it? By the way, how many Adventists do not cook on the seventh day? When I was a kid, we didn't. Uh, I remember the time when we went from cooked peas that were cooked on Friday and reheated on Sabbath morning, but we didn't even keep the idea they weren't supposed to build a fire. And then we finally found it was just as easy to cook the peas on Sabbath instead of heating them. Do not go out of your place. How many do that? Sign between God and Israel. This is key. The Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel. Put to death for a violation of the Sabbath. Violations cut off from the covenant, or violators cut off from the covenant people. Keep the Sabbath continued. You're not to kindle a fire on the Sabbath. Have you ever wondered what that meant? Have you ever tried to keep it? Would kindle a fire mean you rub two sticks together? Would it mean that you just kind of blow on the coals and keep the coals going? Would it mean you strike a match or turn a knob? Very difficult to draw a line, isn't it? And it's kept from evening to evening. Now here again is another key part. The Sabbath is the sign of the old covenant made only with Israel and finds itself in the very center of the Ten Commandments. If you take the Ten Commandments in Hebrew and start counting back word by word by word, the central phrase is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As an Adventist, I used to promote that, okay? But now we recognize that the ancient Near East Treaty documents always had the sign of the covenant in the very center of the covenant. That's all footnoted in Sabbath and Christ, okay? You shall observe the Sabbath, for it is a sign between me and you throughout whose generations? Israel's generations, okay? So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath as a perpetual covenant. So the Sabbath was a covenant too. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Now, I'd like you to see the three dimensions of the Old Covenant. And I think this helps us uh, understand the, the bigger part of it. The Ten Commandments, as we saw, are the very words of the basic covenant. The many laws of Torah, also called the Book of the Covenant, expand and interpreted, uh, expanded and interpreted the commandments for Israel. It told them how to implement them. And the Sabbath, which is also called the covenant, is the sign of the covenant and stood for the whole covenant. That's why if you violate the Sabbath, you're going to be cut off from the covenant people. Now let's compare it to the United States. Okay, we have a constitution, the basic foundation of our government. The Bill of Rights, judicial and case law expand and interpret the constitution. At least they're supposed to. And three, the flag is the Constitution reduced to, you might say, a symbol. And if you show disrespect for the flag, you show disrespect for the whole government of the United States. Now, Christ is a new covenant. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. Now notice this. I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from prison. This is a messianic prophecy that Jesus is going to do these things, one of which is that he's appointed as a covenant to the people. When I learned this, it sure took a lot of weight off my mind that the Father and Jesus are the New Covenant partners. Who are the partners in the Old Covenant? Israel and God. 
Now look, here's some good text. Hebrews 7.22, Jesus has become a guarantee, the guarantee of a better covenant. It wasn't between the people and God. It was between the Father and the Son. That's why it's built on better promises. Hebrews 8.6, He is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. Jesus said, I've come to do your will, and he did his will. If you look throughout the gospel, especially in John, you know, he only does what his father told him to do. I always do what my father told me to do. He kept the covenant. Hebrews 7.12, For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there change, takes a place of the change of law also. Jesus' commandment to love as he loved is the law of the new covenant that is written on our hearts and reflects, please get this down. We are accused all the time, if you read proclamation, of wanting to live in sin. And we, we left the Adventist church because we wanted to be disobedient. And you know how it goes. But we believe that all the moral principles of Scripture are eternal and they're still applicable, applicable today. It's the ritual laws that are gone and the sacrificial laws that are gone, but the moral principles, not necessarily the specific law, but the principles behind the law are still valid. So we believe in all the principles that, that are taught in all of Scripture. Hebrews 10, 16 to 17, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws on their heart and in their mind I will write them. Then he says, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Matthew uh, 22, uh, 37 to 39, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. The second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, wasn't it interesting that when Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment? And this is his answer that he didn't even go to the Ten Commandments. He went to a place other than that in Scripture. John 15, 12, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. John 15, 17, This I command you, that you love one another. Romans 10, uh, 13, 10, Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is a fulfillment of the law. And this is repeated over and over again. Just like in the Old Covenant, we just read how the, the Ten Commandments are the words of the covenant. Remember that multiple times we, we read that? Now here we have multiple times that the New Covenant is love. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have one, love for one another. In the Old Testament, if a Jew went somewhere, how would a person recognize that he was a Jew? Tell me. Clothing? What? Appearance? Diet? And Sabbath. Okay, those are the key things. The clothes, the diet, and the Sabbath. And in the New Covenant, praise God, what is it? Love. Because love can penetrate all cultures without creating culture wars. Galatians 5.14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. James 2, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. We enter into the blessings of the new covenant when we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as our covenant keeper. We don't keep the new covenant we have somebody who has kept it perfectly. So how do we get into the blessings? By placing our faith in our covenant keeper. And that's why we can have the assurance of salvation. Romans 5.10, we shall be saved by our obedient life? No, we're saved by his life. 2 Corinthians 5.21, you all know that by heart. So that we might become the righteousness of God where? in him. Ephesians 3, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried on in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident 
access through faith in him. You know, the Old Testament, the priest would tremble when they, on the Day of Atonement, when they went into the holy place. They had to offer all kinds of sacrifices and such. But we can enter in with Jesus with boldness because he has fulfilled the law for us. John 6, 47, he who believes has eternal life. And again, I never cease to say that this is present continuous in Greek, which means it's an ongoing present reality. And when you understand, really understand, that no matter what happens, we have eternal life. Now, not at the second coming, not at death, we have it now. And at this death or the second coming or the rapture, whenever it, you know, this life changes, it's going to go on. We're going to be with Jesus. And that is good news. John 6, 47. This is a simple gospel, my friend. We used to make it too hard. And I praise God, it's simple. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. How do you get righteousness? By believing. Now, the Old Covenant had two signs. Okay, The first was a one-time entrance sign with circumcision. Now, this is actually the sign of the Abrahamic Covenant. Okay, But because the nation of Israel were descendants from Abraham, it also, you might say, was active during the Sinai Covenant too. So if a, if a foreigner joined the Israelites, uh, the men had to be circumcised before they could do the Passover and all the, the ceremonies. But the sign that it was to remember was the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay? And the Sabbath was a covenant. The covenant, the whole covenant, reduced to a sign. Circumcision, and this is critical, circumcision was considered more important than the Sabbath. What does that tell you about the Sabbath? Huh? It tells you it's less important, and it also tells you that it's a ritual law. All right? In John 7, 23, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire well, a man well on the Sabbath? See, here was the dilemma that they had. It said, Scripture said that you should circumcise a, a male on the which day? Eighth day. What happened if the eighth day fell on the Sabbath? Whoops, you got a problem because circumcision was considered work. So are you going to break the law of the eighth day for circumcision or are you going to break the Sabbath? Okay, you, so you, and now, now follow the logic. You're really not an Israelite until you're circumcised. So circumcision takes precedence over the Sabbath. Do you see that? And that's the way the Jews interpreted it. And that says something about the Sabbath as well. Now, the new covenant signs, we know what they are. The one-time entrance sign into Christ is what? Every time the words into Christ are mentioned, it's in connection with baptism. Now, we don't believe that baptism is, uh, you know, is, is, has a salvation you know, component to it, but I believe that it does have a very important component that if we really have accepted Jesus Christ, we ought to make a public confession of baptism to show the Lord that we love him and have accepted him. And the sign Christians are to remember is the Lord's Supper. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this, why? In remembrance. The Old Covenant, remember the Sabbath. New Covenant, remember the Lord's Supper. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, I want to spend some time on this verse. And if there's some of you who are still questioning all of this, I mean, I, I know how hard it was for me to leave the old Sabbath. Hebrews 8, 13 to 9, 4. When he said a new covenant, he made the what? First one, 
Uh, what was the first covenant? He's talking about the Ten Commandments. Now, are we sure he's talking about the Ten Commandments? Let's go on. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is what? Ready to disappear. Now, even the first covenant, he's going to now tell us what the first covenant is. The first covenant had regulations of divine worship. Let's stop there for a second. What are those regulations of divine worship? Their divine worship was the daily burnt offerings, sacrifices. It was the Sabbaths that had sacrifices. It was the new moons. In fact, the sacrifices for the new moons are almost identical, often are identical, for the sacrifices for Sabbath. And then you have the annual feasts, and then the sabbatical years, and so on. So the first covenant had regulations of divine worship, one of which was the Sabbath, and an earthly sanctuary, and so on. Skipping down now near the bottom, in which was the golden jar of manna uh, holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which budded, and what? The ta uh, tablet or tables of the covenant. So the first covenant had what? It had in it the regulations of divine worship, which included the Sabbath, and it had the tables of the covenant, which included the Sabbath. And it just, got, it just said that when he said new covenant, he made the first can you buy that? What does that mean? Does it mean we can go out and kill and steal and commit adultery? We've been told that, haven't we? Okay, the Sabbath was a ritual law and only a shadow of Christ. Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food, drink, or respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. This is probably the most important text on this, for the Sabbath in the, New, in the New Testament. I mean, there's many, but this is a really important one. Now, notice I've colored these differently. We know that the Sabbath in Colossians 2.16 refers to weekly Sabbath because the terms, or when the terms festival, new moon, and Sabbath are used together, they are found in either ascending or descending order. For example... Days, months, seasons, Sabbaths, new moons, fixed festivals. Or seasons, months, days, fixed festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths. So we're going to give you some examples now to prove this law. First Chronicles 23, and to offer all burnt offerings to the Lord on Sabbaths and new moons and fixed festivals. Second Chronicles 2.4, to offer burnt offerings morning and evening on Sabbaths and new moons and appointed feasts. Appointed feast is the same as fixed festivals. Second Chronicles 31.3 For the morning and evening burnt offerings and for the burnt offerings on Sabbaths and new moons and fixed festivals. Now this is backwards. Hosea 2.11 And I will put an end to all of her gaiety, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her festival assemblies. How many of you have seen the new book the Adventists have just put out about uh, what can't be found in Colossians 2.16? Anybody? Okay, well, there's a new book that just came out, and he takes this text, and by all kinds of Hebrew stuff, he tries to show that Colossians 2.16 uh, is dealing with the festal assemblies and not the Sabbaths, Okay. And so the new issue with Sabbath in Christ, I asked Jerry Gladson to write a response to his book because Jerry uh, is a very good Hebrew scholar. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, okay? And uh, he has answered that very, very thoroughly, that definitely Colossians 2.16 does refer to the weekly uh, Sabbath. But I think we have enough evidence right here. Just look at these two texts very carefully. Ezekiel 45.17 it shall be the prince's part to provide the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the drink offerings at feasts and new moon and on Sabbaths. Notice the almost identical parallel uh, to Colossians 2.16. Notice the, uh, the grain goes with food, the drink with drink, the feast with festival, the new moons with new moon, and Sabbath with Sabbath. And then it says, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, I think that's pretty clear. 
Don't you? All right. Now, here's what Walter Martin said. It's significant that in 59 out of 60 occurrences in the New Testament, Adventists affirm that Sabbatismon refers to the weekly Sabbath, but in the 60 occurrence, they maintain it does not, although all grammatical authors contradict this. Okay, the Old Testament Sabbath was associated two times with moral law. Can anybody tell me where those two times are? What, what chapters? Exodus 20? Deuteronomy 5. You got it, okay. But those are the two times the commandments are listed in Exodus and Deuteronomy. So if the Sabbath is associated two times with those, but it's associated a dozen times with ritual laws like new moons and so on. So if you're going to say, well, the Sabbath has to be a moral law because it's associated with Ten Commandments, you're going to have to say by a six-to-one ratio, the Sabbath must be a ritual law. If you're going to go ahead and say it's the association that makes it ritual or moral. Do, do, you, do you see that? All right. When defending... Uh, when defending his questionable Sabbath activities, Jesus always used Old Testament ritual laws, and he never used a moral law to defend his, quote, questionable activities that he did on the Sabbath. For example, priests in the temple, they had to do things on Sabbath that would typically break the law, but because they were doing it that way, it was part of the ritual, it was okay. And David, remember when he ate the consecrated bread? The consecrated bread thing, that's all ritual. And circumcision on the Sabbath, we read that. These are all ritual laws that Jesus used to defend what he was doing on the Sabbath. It took me a long time to come up to this, to really believe it, that Jesus broke several of the Old Covenant ritual laws. He touched a leper. The person who touched the leper was considered unclean and they had specific things they were to do to be cleansed that Jesus apparently did not do. At least we have no record that he did. He touched a dead person. The person who touched a dead person was considered unclean. Jesus broke the Sabbath. Now many people will say, Oh, Dale, don't say that Jesus broke the Sabbath because he's our Savior, and if he broke the law, he can't, you know, be our Savior. Let's, like, like Mark says, you know, it, let's take the Bible for what it says. Follow carefully. For this reason, that this is dealing with the man who was at the pool of Bethesda that Jesus healed on the Sabbath and told him, pick up your bedroll and walk. Jesus didn't say, hey friend, I'm making you well right now, but come back after sundown and get your bed. He didn't do that. And the, and the man had been there 38 years and there's no indication that he was in a critical situation. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. Now, if you're accused of working on the Sabbath, and you answer, My father is working, and I'm working, what do you think they'll think? That you're working, okay? Does that make sense? <laughs> you know, I, I, I would think that if Jesus wasn't working on the Sabbath that day, he would have said, hey, look, guys, this really doesn't, isn't work. And here's the reason this isn't work. This bed doesn't weigh enough to be work. Have you ever, I mean, the guy had been there for 38 years on a stone floor, apparently, and it gets cold in Jerusalem. I've backpacked many, many miles, probably hundreds of miles, with lightweight gear. But if you took the old wool blankets probably, probably had a pad there, I mean, he'd been there 38 years, surely you had a good mattress pad, and put that up, that would be a burden. And you were not to carry a burden on the Sabbath. So Jesus asked him to do something that the Jews knew was Sabbath-breaking. Okay? For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath. Who said that, by the way? John. Did John know Jesus very well? Was he the closest disciple? 
Did he understand the gospel? For sure. He was also calling God his own father. Now, were both of these true or just one? Was God his father? Sure. So both of these are true. Now, Kittle's Theological Dictionary is considered the premier Greek dictionary. It's a, a multiple volume dictionary. And uh, it gives the following translations for was breaking the Sabbath used in John 17. Used in this specific text, this is the way that this Kittle's Theological Dictionary, it's a Greek dictionary, tells you how you should translate it. Any of the following. To break up, to destroy, to dismiss, to set aside, to invalidate. All right, now, was breaking is a imperfect in Greek. Now, what does that mean? It means that it's durative. And it could be translated, he was continually breaking the Sabbath. And this phrase could accurately be translated any of the following ways. He not only was continually breaking the Sabbath, he not only was continually destroying the Sabbath, he not only was continually setting aside the Sabbath, he not only was continually invalidating the Sabbath. Any of those are correct translations based upon the Greek text. Now, what is the purpose of ritual law? The ritual law was to point to the Messiah. Are we agreed on that? And it's kind of fun to go back to the ritual laws and see if you can figure out what the point was, you know, what, 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 the, what the era was. But once Christ had come, they lost much, but not all of their value. They still had historical significance. Uh, when we went on our trip... Uh, in 2009, we went uh, 10,800 miles with our travel trailer giving these uh, messages in different evangelical churches. Before we left, Carolyn had uh, went to uh, Google Maps or something. She had a map of every, every section. Uh, and we would uh, go through one, uh, one section, you know, and say, okay, I can put that map down. Now we're in this second map. Well, we didn't throw the map away. We kept it. Because we could go back and say, oh, I remember where this was, where we took this picture, where we met with these people, you see? And so we can go to the Old Testament, all these old ritual laws, and we can say, well, here's something that points forward to Christ. Here's something that points forward to Christ. And they still have historical value, even though they have no, in a sense, religious value. When Christ had come, the strict observance of ritual laws often hindered the people from accepting him as a Messiah. Now this is key. The ritual laws, once the person came to whom the ritual laws pointed, and you focused on the ritual laws, you missed the one that the ritual law was pointing to. And that's exactly what happened. The Jews were in a hurry to try and crucify Christ so they could go home and keep the Sabbath according to the commandment. And you look at that and you just, your heart cries out, Lord, how come? God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth, not in ritual and shadow. We have this in John, told it to the woman at the well, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, Jesus brings the true rest of which the Old Covenant Sabbath was only a ritual shadow. He said, Come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, and the word yoke often in scriptures referred to the law. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your bodies. No, rest for your soul. See, this, this is rest goes way beyond the, the, the body rest day, okay? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In Hebrews 4, I have a whole chapter in Sabbath in Christ on this text. For we who have believed enter that rest. Now, in the Old Covenant, you never find belief associated with the Sabbath. 
It's always works. Do this, don't do that, so on, okay? Jesus says, the true rest you enter by believing. And believing is in the aorist tense in Greek. And aorist typically in Greek means an instantaneous action that happened in the past. What was that action? Tell me. When you believed. When you were born again. At that moment, you entered into God's rest. And that rest continues. It's not a rest just one day a week. And after sundown, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> You've been there and done that too. Huh? <laughs> okay, well, what does the New Testament teach about the Sabbath? Acts 1, 3. To these also he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs and appeared to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. You say, well, Dale, what does that have to do with the Sabbath? It's interesting that there is no evidence that the risen Christ ever met with his disciples on a Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? Every appearance of the risen Lord when a day is mentioned was on the first day of the week. Now I have a whole lot of slides on the first day of the week but I've put them out because Mark's going to be speaking on that and I don't want to uh, you know speak what he's going to be speaking on. That would be duplication. You don't need that. Now there is no command to keep the Sabbath in the New Testament and if the Sabbath is the most important of all the commandments why in the world would that be? Okay? All the Sabbath meetings in the book of Acts were in a Jewish setting. There is no mention of Sabbath meetings in any of the Gentile churches. Do you begin to see this? It's pretty clear, isn't it? There is no instruction on how to keep the Sabbath in letters written to young Gentile churches. Now this is maybe a, an argument for silence, but it is a huge argument. Because at the time of Christ there were those who rabbis who said, well, you can do this on the Sabbath. Another rabbi said, no, this is the way you keep the Sabbath. And then Jesus comes along and fouls both of those up, okay? And so if I was a Gentile going into a Gentile church that kept the Sabbath, one of the main questions would be, tell me, how do I do it? Can I build a fire? Can I cook? Can I go out of my place? Well, how do you keep the Sabbath? But it is just silent. There is no instruction on how to keep the Sabbath. And Sabbath breaking, of all things, was never mentioned in any lists of New Testament sins. And there's a number of lists of New Testament sins, some of them quite long. Sabbath isn't there. When the Sabbath is mentioned in the epistles, it's either in a negative or unimportant context. However, there is mention of first day meetings in young Gentile churches. I'm going to skip those now. Now the detailed laws of the Old Covenant are now superseded by moral principles interpreted by the Holy Spirit to the circumstances of life. Now that is a hermeneutic. You might say a principle of interpretation. You can go to the Old Testament and you can look for the moral principle behind that law and you can take that principle and apply it to the day. And uh, that's the way I believe we should do it. Not of the letter, but what? Of the Spirit. The letter kills. The Spirit gives life. The letter was a ministry of death instead of ministry, of the, and now it's a ministry of Spirit. The Old Testament was a ministry of condemnation. The New is a ministry of righteousness. The Old came with glory on Mount Sinai. But now the glory it, you know, abounds in glory. And now that glory has faded. And now the glory remains. Oops, went too fast there. The new covenant righteousness is not even associated with old covenant law. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. And then Romans 4. For the promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. Now I think our worship leader uh, referred to this this morning, you know, as a text that she read in our worship. 
But I want to look at it again very carefully. Notice what I have highlighted. Philippians 3, 6-9. As to the righteousness which is in the law, what did Paul say? Found blameless. So Paul kept the letter of the law. Do you see that? But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish. So what does he say? He says, that law-keeping that I had, that I did, I count it but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Second Corinthians, phenomenal passage. There's so many like this. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. What was, what was the veil? Looking through the Old Covenant, okay? Because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, not legalism. Now, I, I, I'm going to... Well, how's our time? I think I better stop. Five minutes? Okay. I want you... Have, have I shown you this before? Okay. This is really important. And it will clarify. And I'm going to clarify in our talk of... Uh, when we get to Galatians, I'm going to refer to this again. But I want you to see it now. The red line represents justification by faith, the righteousness of God. The yellow line represents sanctification or internal righteousness, our internal righteousness. Not the biblical concept of sanctification, but the progressive concept. And the evan evangelical gospel says that we are saved by God's grace, which, the righteousness which is in Christ from day one to the second coming or the rapture, whatever happens, or death, right? And the yellow represents internal righteousness. The Holy Spirit does help us develop a certain amount of righteousness. But we don't trust that righteousness. It's not meritorious. It's valuable for many reasons. But it's not part of our salvation. But here's the Adventist gospel. And I want you to, and I grew up on this. And they, they told me this. Or I mean, they had diagrams of it. And here's the quote. When it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth to this end, Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service and makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. Now, I used to think that was a beautiful statement. I really did. Until I began to analyze them. What it is saying that... You can, see, can you see my arrow on the screen? Okay, like this arrow here, that represents when it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put to the, forth to this end, okay? He accepts that, but he makes up the deficiency with his own divine merit. So we're saved partly by the righteousness that is in us, and partly by the righteousness that is in Christ. And the goal of Adventism, I, I'm going to be strong here, is to get to the place where it's all in us. And forget the righteousness of Christ. That is the goal of Adventism. Because here's the close of probation up there. And what do we do after the close of probation? Where do we live? We live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. And I'm going to give you some quotes this afternoon. Or is it tomorrow? <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, how we have to perfectly obey the law of God. And God is waiting, Ellen White says. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his people. And when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. I used to think that was a beautiful statement too. So what it's saying is that the Adventist goal is to live perfectly up here 
And we're going to, we, I'm still, <laughs> not anymore, but the Adventists are going to prove that you can keep the law. That is the whole message of Adventism, is to prove to the world and to the universe that the law can perfectly be kept. And that is exactly contrary that we will see when we get into Galatians. So again, I want you to see these two different things and understand them. The evangelical gospel, we're trusting Christ's righteousness from day one to the end. And the Adventist gospel, you trust partly your righteousness and partly God's righteousness. And with that, let's close. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for the truth that you have freed us from legalism, Lord. You have freed us from the idea that we have to do all this in order to be accepted. That we can simply believe with our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and is raised from the dead and we can be saved and know it. And Lord, I just pray that if there's any here who still have questions, that they'll come and we'll be able to answer those questions. And they'll go to your word, mostly, Lord, we know how it happens. Your Holy Spirit convinces and convicts of truth. And we thank you for the Spirit that is here in our place, in our hearts, as we focus and fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen.